this week. But today, I want to equip you to see behind the curtain, right? To, to, to see with clarity who we are and what we are about and what that means for your life and what it means for the city and what it means for the world around us. You ever had those moments where you walked into a conversation and you realized they were talking about you? Have you ever had that moment? Hopefully it was like a positive they were talking about you. Like, oh, she's the prettiest person I've ever seen. You're like, who are we talking about? Right? Hopefully it was one of those. My, my family, we've been watching uh, some Survivor episodes. Anybody watch the show Survivor? Anybody? It, it, sometimes it's good and sometimes you're like, whoa, whoa, people are messed up. Right? But almost every episode, there's a moment where there's a group of people. They're like, who are we going to vote out? Who, who are we going to? I think we should vote Jeremy out. And about the time they say we should vote Jeremy out, Jeremy pops out from a tree and's like, hey, guys, what are we talking about? And they're like, we're talking about jelly-filled donuts, how we wish we, wanted a, we wish we had a jelly-filled donut on this island in Fiji, right? But wouldn't it be nice to know all the positive things that people are saying about you? I, I say that because I want you to know that there are some positive things that this church is praying for you, even when you don't know it. Like this morning, the chair that you were sitting in, Someone laid their hands on that chair and they prayed for the person that was sitting in it. They prayed God's promises over your life. They prayed that you would experience the presence of God in a very powerful way today. You were being talked about behind your back. Between us and God. All the things that we want for you. And that's the thing I love about this church. And I think it's a powerful force to be reckoned with when you get into a group of people that are praying God's promises over your life even when you aren't around and that's what we get to be a part of and I want to show you this prayer that really is a, a model for us as is the people of God of how we should pray for one another it comes from Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is writing this, and he, he says this is his prayer over this church. And I want you to know this, that this is my prayer over you, this is our church leader's prayer over you, this is every prayer that we're praying every Sunday, every Monday, every Tuesday, we are praying these things over your life. This is what it says, Ephesians 1, 17 and 19. Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And isn't that at the core of the longing of our hearts, just to know God better? So I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. What a powerful prayer. That whatever's causing us to not see, maybe it's all the baggage, maybe it's the pain, maybe it's the hurt, maybe it's our own habits, whatever's clouding our vision, that those things would move out of the way and we would have a, a clarity around the hope to which God's called us. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. This prayer that we would just come to know God and as we step closer to him, we would start to experience every promise that he has and all the stuff that's accumulated in our past that, that's preventing us from moving forward would just begin to fall away. And we would begin to see with clarity the hope that God has for our life. We begin to see the value of his promises. We begin to walk in fruitfulness in relationship with him and in relationship with his people. What a beautiful picture this is God's heart for us this is our prayer for you this is with clarity where we as a church should be moving see the vision of our church isn't about a building it isn't about a what we are becoming but a who we are becoming You'll you hear us say quite often what we are about. That we help people move from where they are to where God wants them to be. 
That's it. That's, that's what we are here to do. We are here to help people move from where they are to where God wants them to be. You go, well, where does God want them to be? He wants them to know Him. He wants them to find freedom. He wants them to discover purpose. He wants them to make a difference. And He wants it for every single one of us. And that's why we pray. That's the way we serve. That's why we do what we do so that every person, you and me and every person in this city that we haven't even met yet, would experience everything that God has for them. We help people move. That's why we're called Motion Church, because we want to help people move. There's something active about our faith. It's not built upon just some principles that have been preserved for thousands of years, but it's upon a real living God that is actively moving in our lives, and we are actively pursuing Him and pursuing the world that we live in. See, we have a vision here that is about people living full and fulfilling lives. It's a vision for the homeless person in our community to overcome their hurdles and their struggles and their past and be equipped and live a fulfilling future. It's a picture of a 20-year-old who is wrestling with whether God even exists to now having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and knowing he exists because he speaks into his or her life every single day. It's a picture of a 30-year-old going, how am I this young and I've amassed this much pain and this much hurt and this much struggle in my life and them realizing that the work of the Holy Spirit will lead them to freedom And they don't have to have their whole future shaped by what's happened already in their life. That they begin to experience freedom. See, the vision of this church is for the the, the 50-year-old to realize that, that there's so much purpose found in how God wired them. And it wasn't just about accumulating a a great resume it wasn't just about accumulating the the right house or the right car but there was something purposeful in the way God designed them it's for the 65 year old to go what is my legacy and what is the impact that I leave behind and it's way more than what they accomplish it's the people that they were able to influence and impact The vision of our church is about how we help people move from where they are to where God wants them to be. It's about how we are actively in that process. And God is moving us from where we are to where God wants us to be. See, the closer we get to God, and the closer that we are to God's people the more likely we are to experience all of God's promises. But this isn't the trend in our society, is it? This isn't the world that we live in. right? There's, there's patterns and habits and a, and a whole trajectory that's happening in the world around us that we have to be aware of. We cannot be blind to. Right? Like our hearts can long for the promises of God, but we have to pay attention to what the patterns of the world around us are. Otherwise, we will not be able to step into everything that God has for us. I remember February 12th, 2012, the same day that this church had its very first Sunday. If you don't know, I, I, I took over as pastor of this church in 2015. It was right before its third year anniversary. Prior to that, I had planted a new church in Wilmington, North Carolina. And on the same day that this church had its very first Sunday, there was a guy named Sean that rode his bike 10 miles that Sunday morning to my church in North Carolina. He showed up. Seeking God, and he found God. And he gave his life to Christ on that very Sunday. After church was done, we we met in a high school uh, cafeteria. We'd bring in all this stuff and set up a stage and set up lighting and do all this kind of stuff. After we tore everything down, he actually stayed and helped us tear everything down. Uh, He was about ready to hop on his bike and and ride home. We were like, "Um, I think we can give you a ride. I think we can give you a ride. Over the next several months, 
Sean began to lean into the work of God in his life. But also Sean had to face the reality that most of his friend circle were practicing the things that he was trying to leave. I'll never forget the day he showed up. He was supposed to get baptized that day. And he said, I just, I don't know if I can get baptized. This week I did meth again. I did meth again. And we talked through that and we prayed through that. And, and over the next few years, his relationship with me was a lot of, of, of coming in and him trying to chase after God, but finding that he had surrounded himself with a group of people that were heading in one direction. And me showing up at his apartment sometimes, knocking on his door, calling him, texting him, being in his life saying, Sean, God's got promises for your life and I know you know that and I want to help you walk in that path. I want you to walk, but you found yourself among a group of people that are running in one direction and they're leading you away from what God wants for you. Fought for Sean for a long time, even to the point where... uh, Emptied a bunch of money out of my own personal savings to pay all the costs for him to go to a program called Teen Challenge. Loaded him up in the car and took him there. Thankfully, he's won that battle more than he's lost because he started to surround himself with people moving in the same direction. See, there's something important that we have to examine in our life. Is the people that are closest to us, are they moving towards the things of God? Or are they moving away? Because God has a promise for each one of us to know Him, to find freedom, to discover purpose, to make a difference. To walk in that full and fulfilling life. But we would be, we would be naive if we... If we didn't acknowledge that that's not where our world is heading. Right? This is not the pattern of the world that we live in. And if we find ourselves not being intentional about the habits of our own life. We will find ourselves going in the trends of society. And the question that I have for us today. Is this. Am I allowing the trends. Of the world I live in. To condition me. For what the world has for me. Or am I allowing. God to transform me through the work of his spirit. And the work of his people. In my life. Am I moving towards what God has for me. Or am I moving towards what this world has conditioned me. To do. That's a good question for all of us. Because who we are becoming is one of the most important things that we need to address. How do we we fight this? I think, one, we have to recognize that we live in a world that uh, creates a very me-centric. Me-centric. Like, I become the center of my universe. This is the society we live in. It's a postmodern society where where it's all about us. Right? You can tell this... You want to know who can really testify to the world that we live in and how me-centric it is? Uh, Go interview a Starbucks barista. And they will tell you how me-centric it is. Because listen, Starbucks, they got 37 million things on their menu, right? And they have perfected this recipe and that recipe and this recipe. But Janet will show up and be like... I want the caramel macchiato, but I want, you to, I want you to leave this out. I want you to add double of this. I want you to shake it and stir it. I want you to spin around. I want you to make it on top of your, upside down, right? And can you put, I want the small portion, but I want it in a large cup, and I want 37 pieces of ice in it. Yes, ma'am, and what's your name again? Satan? I mean, Janet. Janet, yes, let me write that down, right? But we become so me-centric. I remember as a kid, even part of the culture of the home that I grew up in, I remember even 
my grandfather instilling these principles, saying, hey, there's things we don't talk about. We don't talk about money with people. We don't talk about politics with people. We don't talk about Jesus. And I remember as a kid having that influence that this relationship with Jesus was just this private thing, just me. And the whole thing became so me-centric. But that's not how we're designed to work. That's not, the, that's not the way that we're supposed to live. We've got to move from me to we. We have to move from this own isolated relationship with Jesus to being a part of the body of Christ and the benefits of being around other believers. We have to, we have to move away from the trends that are happening in society and move towards the things that are going to help us experience all the promises of God. Let me highlight one trend that's interesting in the world that we live right now. I'm going to put a, a chart up on the screen. You won't be able to read any of the words, so I'll highlight them for you. You'll see three lines on this chart. The top line, the dark black line that you see going downwards, that's the number of people in the past 20 years that attend church on a weekly basis. You can see the last little downhill curve is from 2020 to 2022. That there is a trajectory, that there is a pattern, that there is a habit, even among churchgoers that go, I don't, I don't really know that being a part of church on a regular basis is a part of the way that I'm going to live my life. The yellow line that you see growing, right? And typically we want to, like if we're charting out things in our life, we kind of want to go up and to the right. This is not one of those we want to see go up and to the right. The yellow line is the number of people who say they never attend church at all. This is the pattern over the last couple decades. And if we aren't aware of it, then we will just walk in that same pattern. And what's at stake here? Because the closer I get in proximity to God, and the closer that I'm in proximity to God's people the higher the likelihood that I get to experience all the promises of God in my life. Which means if I'm in a pattern of people that are not prioritizing getting around God and getting around His people, then all of a sudden my experience with God's promises is going to be drastically affected. And you know what? I might even blame it on God. God, where are you? Are you even real anymore? I used to be so sure of you. This is an important thing for us to be aware of. We have to ask ourselves whether we want to be trendy and go with the trends of the world or we want to be transformed by God's work in our lives. Here's an interesting uh, set of statistics that match these patterns. 20% of Americans attend church every week. 41% of Americans are in monthly attendance. 57% of Americans are seldom or never in a religious service at all. Although nearly 50% of people attended church weekly as a child, only 20% attend weekly as adults. Volunteering in church even continues to drop. With 40% of church membership, this nationwide, volunteering in early 2020... Now only 20% volunteering in March of 2022. And they said at this point that expected to decrease. Let me ask you this. If you were to take coals in a fire, which coal is going to burn the brightest? The one that is close to all the others that are on fire? Or the one that separates itself from the group. Today, I want to do a few different things. I, I want to paint a picture of what our values can move us towards. I want to I paint happy little trees, right? 
I want, to, I want us to see all the beauty of what the values that God has for our life, what they can move us towards and the beauty of that. But I also, I also want to stand in the road where the bridge is out and go, guys, don't keep going down this road. I love you too much. There's patterns and there's trends and they are not leading to the things that you're hoping for. And so you'll feel that tension between the, the happy trees and the warnings. My hope today is that you see with clarity that God has a plan for your life. And there's a next step for you to take to grow in it. I want to give a call to you. To let your values as a follower, follower of Jesus move you in the direction that is best for your life. Not what is common in your life. We had this conversation often through the years raising my kids. Our family values. Right? Sometimes, sometimes things will happen and, we, and before a situation we go, hey, this is what we believe and this is how we function as a family. So that's why we're going to make this decision and we're going to move in this direction. Sometimes, listen, I got pastors, kids, they never made a mistake ever in their life, okay? But on the slight chance that they might have, right? That conversation would often look like that behavior doesn't match the values. That doesn't match the values that we have. So we need to take our behavior and we need to match it to our values. The beauty is, is that the values of a follower of Jesus move us forward in a really powerful way. So there's four values that we have as a church family here. And I want to highlight those for you. To paint some happy trees, but also to call you to watch where the patterns of your life are leading. You and our church. The first value is this. We put God first. We put God first. So this is a character trait, but it's also a, a character trait that impacts our attitudes, and it impacts our habits. We put God first. We believe God is the most holy of all things in all of creation, and all of the universe, that, that He stands above it all, that we live underneath His authority and His rule and His reign, and we want our life in every area to point to Him being first. In a way, we, it's almost like we scan our lives and go, where is there a first? Let me put Jesus in there. It's the reason why so many, so many millennia ago, the church of Jesus Christ said, you know what? Let's take the first day of the week on Sunday. But yet, Sabbath is, is the other day, but we're going to take the first day, and we're going to come together, and we're going to worship Jesus. The first, the first. It's the reason why we as a staff at, at Motion, we gather on the first day that we're in the office on Mondays. The first thing that we ever do is we gather together in prayer because we're like, before we get to work, we want to acknowledge God's presence in this office. We want to pray, we want to seek. It's the reason why me, a night owl, said, you know what, it doesn't matter that I'm a night owl, the first thing I'm going to do in the morning is I'm going to seek Jesus. I'm going to pray and I'm going to read his word. And so as followers of Jesus, we're always going, where do we put God first? How can we, where can he be first place in my life? I mean, even the principle of tithing used to, I tithe because I was taught to, I was tithe because I was supposed to. But then something shifted when I was like, wait a second, I need this to be first place. I need to, I, I, this is why I started scheduling my tithe because I was like, wait a second, I scheduled my mortgage payment. Let me schedule this one to be right in front of that. And there's something that happens in my heart when I open up my bank account and I see on, on the first of every month that first transaction that hits. Right after my, the deposit, boom, right there. I see Motion Church. 
And I'm always looking for, where is the first? Where is the first? Because when order is restored, blessing follows. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There's something about just walking in the right order and getting God in the right place that gives you the right perspectives, puts you in the right place. And here's the reality. All throughout my journey with Jesus, I stumble upon places where he has not first. And I have to face a a reality of the fact that my normal doesn't put him first. But there's this beautiful realization that I can take control of my normal. Right? Normal doesn't just have to describe what I'm used to experiencing. It can describe the life that I am creating for myself. And so when normal doesn't match God's order, it's time to create a new normal. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to look for the first in your life. And go, is God there? And if he's not, then rush as fast as you can to go, man, I want him. I want the first day of the week to be for my family a place where we worship God and put him first. And we get around God's people. I understand that the trends of the society we live in are moving away from that. But I want to move towards his promises. I want to move towards his blessing. I want to move towards closer proximity to him. So I'm going to look for the first day of the week. Sundays are a priority. I'm going to look for every day. How can I put him first? How can I start my day with him? Anywhere there could be a first, I want him to be in that place. See, at Motion, we believe Sundays are a priority. And there's something beautiful about Sundays. Because on Sundays, we get to help people know God. We get to help people know God and experience his presence in a really powerful way. (laughs) Several weeks ago, somebody in our church was telling me, she said, I don't know if you remember the first Sunday that I came. She said, I had recently been diagnosed with cancer. And I found myself around a bunch of people who didn't believe that God healed anymore. And I thought, I've got to change the people that I'm around. And she said, and I heard about motion, and I came hoping and expecting. And she said, and I was met by the most loving people in this place. And on that very first Sunday, I was able to come down, and the prayer team prayed for me to experience healing from what I was facing. Man, we need that every day. But let's at least get it on the first day of the week. So we put God first. The second value that we have is that we are better together. We are better together. Ephesians 4.16 is a, a picture, a zoom in on this concept from a biblical perspective. Paul says this, talking about God, that he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Fit together, this isn't like a puzzle where you're like, I got to fit this piece in this spot, but it's not the right piece. No, he makes it fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. And it's each part, and each part he's talking about is us. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What a beautiful picture. Everything fit together. I've seen this happen time and time again in connect groups. We have connect groups seasonally. Every connect group season, I see people get fit together in such a way that they find freedom in their life. That people go, I I didn't realize that what a life-giving friendship could do in my life. I thought that I would have to live with this frustration, this unforgiveness, this pain, this hurt, this habit. I thought I was stuck in this forever. But all of a sudden, I was fit together perfectly in a life-giving relationship. I want to encourage you, our fall connect group season is coming. 
Make sure you as a part of the body of Christ are stepping into that environment so that you can see what happens when you are fit together and God works through that relationship to bring wholeness, bring healing so the whole body is healthy. Another way people are fit together is in serving. Right? Serving is an act, aspect of the character of God. We serve others because he first served us and loved us. And There's something powerful when people come together and all of a sudden they realize the gifts and the talents and the potential and the purpose that has been put in their life. And they start coming together and they realize, wait a second, this is, this is something powerful. I've been fit together for fulfillment. Fulfillment happens when we come together and there's something beautiful in that. And so we look for those opportunities. How can I be better together? How can I be fit together in such a powerful way? As, as we approach the fall, I really want you to think about those two ways that we as a body of Christ work together. One, make sure that Sundays are a priority, but make sure you're leaning in to the relationships that exist in groups. We are very intentional as a church. Listen, I grew up when I was young, and we went to church Sunday morning, we went to church Sunday evening, and we went to church Wednesday night. And sometimes they was, all felt like the same exact thing with just a slight little tweak, right? We're very intentional. We go, you know what, let's make Sunday mornings about something very specific, but then let's free up some time so that people can lean into groups and to serving so they can experience other aspects of the promises of God for their life. So this fall, I want you to make sure groups are a part of how you are fit together. And I want you to make sure teams are a part. And if you're already serving on a team, I want you to examine the consistency around those relationships. Because consistency brings intimacy and community and fulfillment and joy. And even from a practical standpoint... I want you to just look around the room. We are in the middle, of, we're at the end of July. This is vacation season at its height, right? In the next month to two, if we continue in one service, we are going to have a capacity issue, which is a great problem to have, right? But we're going to have a capacity issue in every room in our motion kids, in this room, and then if, if we remain in one service, we're going to have to, some of you are going to have to sit in the lobby and watch on a TV. And you go, well, why don't we just plop back to two? The hope and the intent is that we will. But I want to point out something. The timing that we return back to two services isn't going to be determined by the calendar. It's going to be determined by our teams being able to serve as full teams providing fulfilling ministry. This isn't a big hurdle for us to accomplish because we have uh, over 120 people that call themselves a part of the dream team and to fill two services of fulfilling ministry, it only takes about 65 people. So mathematically, easy solution, right? But the trend of society has turned into serving as something that's pretty sparse and scattered. And so even though we have twice as many people as space to serve, we often have 35 to 40 people serving on a Sunday. Which means there's things that we dream we could do in our kids' ministry that we're just, we just need the consistency on those teams to be able to do it. And so I, I just want to challenge you to even examine your, your fit on the team and your consistency because our capacity as a church, we're at this crossroads. Our capacity as a church over the next couple months is going to be determined by our consistency and willing to serve others. And this is a beautiful thing that we get to be a part of. A couple other values, I'll run a little bit quicker through those. One is that we see the future in people. I will never forget, and I will tell the story over and over and over, and if you've been in this church for years, you've heard this story, and I'll tell it again, because I like to hear it. And when you're the one with the microphone, sometimes you just get to tell stories that you like to hear. I will never forget being in eighth grade, 
pulling my family to church, stepping into this church environment. And after only being there for a few months, the pastor looks at me and says, Jason, will you teach a Sunday school class for middle school boys? I go, I am a middle school boy. But he saw something in me. And he connected that to an opportunity and it stirred up the gifts in me. And it was such a gift. It was such a blessing to be at such a young age and understand the calling that God had on my life. And it was because this pastor saw the future in me. And that shaped me and it shaped a value in my life and it shaped a value for this church. I want you to know if this is your first Sunday or even you're just checking it out online. You're like, I don't know if I want to attend this church or not. I'm going to watch a sermon first. We all did that. We know. We know. Thank the Lord for websites. I want you to know our prayer for you is so much bigger than your church attendance. Our prayer for you is that you would know God better. Our prayer for you is the things that you thought that you had to deal with for the rest of your life you would find freedom from. Our prayer for you is that your eyes would be open to the hope that God has for you. The riches of His glorious inheritance in His people. This beautiful thing. I was just having a conversation last week with someone, she had just moved here only lived in Lexington for a month, came to our church for the very first time. I I talked to her after a few people in our lobby had already been talking with her for for a long time. And I looked at her and I said, Susie, I'm so excited for you. Because literally, you have been in our church for two hours and you already have two people that know you by name and are excited about your future. And I know that in in the next two months, if you will just lean into, like, if you'll go to next steps, all of a sudden you'll start realizing all the things available to you to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. And all of a sudden, even more people will know your name and care about your future. I said, at the beginning of September, our groups are starting. When you step into that group, you're going to get into an environment where you might find your one or two people that become your best friends friends in life I was like Susie I'm so excited of just the possibilities of what two months in your life connected with motion could do and I could just see her eyes open and light up what I said to her is the same thing that I would say to each one of you I'm so excited about what the next two months could do in your life Next two months. I see the future in you. Hebrews 11.1. 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. An assurance of what, what we do not see. I have a faith. What God will do in your life when you lean into him and his people. The last value is that we go the extra mile. This shapes the way we behave. The way we serve. The way we serve one another. The way we serve our city. Also... You know, we'll go across the street to serve someone, but we'll also go across the world. It's the reason why we're we're having serve groups this fall, groups that you can be a part in to serve our city. It's the reason why one of the groups we'll have this fall is preparing you to go to Belize for a mission trip this December. Next year, we'll be opening up even more global trips. Our heart is a global heart. But here's what's at stake. When we move away from God's promises and we move away from God's people, we move away from his values. And this affects our lives and the next generation. So we have to watch where we move. Look at your feet for a second. I know that's a weird question, right? Look, I didn't say look at my feet. Look at your feet, right? Look at your feet. Where will they take you? Where would they take you? As you look at your feet, I want you to bring a question to the Lord. God, what is my next step? What is my next step? 
There's a promise that God gave to Joshua that I just see consistent as a promise that I believe that he would give to each one of us in following him. He said this to Joshua in Joshua 1, 3, as they were preparing to enter the promised land. He said, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. We aren't stepping into the promised land, but there are promises of God that we are meant to walk in. Let us have the same faith that Joshua had to grab a hold of, that same boldness that he prayed for, that same courage that he asked the Lord for so that he would actually step into the promises that God had laid out for them. Let's lean into that. Let's lean into that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Lord, what is... What is our next step? God, we know that you have plans for us. We also know that there's so much value in being surrounded by your people, moving in your direction, seeking your heart. God, what does does me plus motion look like? What are, what are your values in me redirect me to do? God, search my heart. God, are there any habits that I've picked up that are just trends of society? But they're not healthy habits of a believer? God, I I choose my next step carefully, intentionally. I ask that your Holy Spirit would guide me and give me boldness and courage to step into every promise that you have for me. To know you, to find freedom, to discover purpose. And to make a difference in this world. I see it. I see your prayer for me. I see this church's prayer for me. God, and I'm ready to respond. Would you stay in a posture of prayer for just a moment longer? Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I want to let you know that's the first step. And it's the greatest step. And it's a step that changes everything. Because all of a sudden you realize that you aren't stepping alone. You are stepping alongside a God who's come close to you. To love you and equip you for all the things he has in store for you. The Bible is so clear. It's so beautiful. Yeah, we've sinned. And we've fallen short of the glory of God. God, in his great love for us, sent his only son to this earth to die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Our sin deserved death. Our our sin separates us from God. That's the consequences of sin. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so when we put our faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we find forgiveness. We find a fresh start. And I want to encourage you, if that's your next step, let's take it right now. And so right where you are, I just want to lead you in a prayer. Jesus, I come to you. I bring my life and I understand that there are parts of it that are good and beautiful and there are parts of it that I'm ashamed of. And I receive your forgiveness right now. And so I leave these habits and these behaviors in my past. And I even lay down all the shame and the guilt that's associated with them. And I just grab a hold of your love for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for washing me clean as freshly fallen snow. Thank you for giving me a hope and a future. Thank you for making yourself available to me. 
commit my life to following you. Taking each step as you lead. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate the people who prayed that prayer. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, would you stand with me? I'm going to invite our prayer team down. They're going to come, and they're going to be down on the sides of the stage. And I want you to know they are ready. They are ready to pray over every situation you are facing. Or maybe the Lord brings to your mind right now a situation a friend of yours is facing. They are ready to pray with you. Call down the power of heaven in your life. And so I want to encourage you over the next few minutes... We're going to spend time just worshiping, not rushing past a moment, but responding appropriately to what the Lord has been speaking in our hearts. Maybe you want to respond by writing some things on your connection card. Maybe there's some steps you want to have conversations with us about. Maybe you want to go to the back of the room, take communion, or write something and pin it to the cross. Or Maybe you just need the power of prayer moving in your life. Come and grab hands with a prayer team member and let's see God move in a very powerful way. And so I'm going to pray and as soon as I say amen, you feel released to be able to step into whatever your response is this morning and we're going to worship the Lord. God, thank you for this time. We step fully into it to be present with you. You've spoken in our hearts, you've spoken in our lives, God, and there's a next step for us to take. God, may we solidify it in this moment. God, I pray over every prayer. God, even the ones people right now are hesitant. Should I I step forward and be prayed over for this? God, I pray that you would reassure them with a yes. God, that we would see you move powerfully in these next few minutes as we focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen.